Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to the Reselling Rebels podcast episode 6. So in today's podcast we are going to be looking at optimum inventory levels, we're going to be looking at sticky stock and we are also going to be looking at backlogs. So it's not going to be in any sort of order, I've just randomly wrote down a load of different pointers and notes and we will just go through them accordingly. But before we get on with the podcast I just wanted to mention next week's topic which is going to be the rise of YouTube in reselling. So that's going to be talking about the effect that YouTubers had on the reselling community, um, obviously whether it's negatively influenced reselling and saturated the marketplace, whether it's positively impacted, the social implications of it, obviously people being a bit more social and stuff. We'll get into all that next week, but it's a very interesting topic and I know that people are quite polarised on it, so some people will say it's absolutely brilliant and others will say it's the worst thing that's happened to reselling and it's completely saturated everything and all the rest of it. So obviously because it's such a polarising topic, um, if you do have any comments, questions or queries surrounding it, please do drop them down below, have your say. You can also message me over on Instagram if you would like to do that. And of course I do a community tab post centred around the topic of Reselling Rebels a couple of days before I record it each week so that then you have a final chance to get involved and have your say. So with that being said, that's next week's topic. And we will now get on with this week's podcast, which as I say is backlogs, sticky stock and optimum inventory. So first I've just wrote down here, I wanted to touch upon my experiences with backlogs, big hauls, things of that nature essentially. So I've uh, had a few big hauls uh, and when I say big hauls, I mean I've spent maybe £500 550 quid something like that 450 quid um obviously i've had quite a lot of auction hauls around that sort of price but i mean actually sort of private buys as well um so i've had quite a few private buys of around that sort of region and of course that entails there's going to be a fair few boxes worth of stuff especially if you're paying 500 quid unless you're buying things that are a very very high value and unique items or something like that then you might have a few just a few items but generally these were large job lots of stuff so of course that meant that i've got a little bit of a backlog and i remember before i had my lock up um when i was just in the spare room which is to the side of me here um but basically when i just had that it was very, very messy, and I've actually got videos on my channel uh, showing parts of my backlogs when, I, when, I, when it's been really, really bad in the spare room, and obviously if you've been following the channel for quite a while, I'm sure you've seen parts of that journey. Um, and essentially, it can get quite overwhelming, um, it can make you think, is it good, is it bad, is it something that I should have, should I have this huge backlog, is, is it brilliant for me, is it going to mean that essentially, um, you know, I don't have to go out sourcing, so that's brilliant, and is it going to actually make me more efficient, and all the rest of it, and uh, the one thing really that I've found is overwhelming can be an incredibly good word to use in these circumstances, with having these big backlogs, with having this uh, real presence of stock, and quite a lot of it, it can be very, very overwhelming. Now, it's a little bit less so for me now I've got the lockup, and we're going to actually go into uh, lockups as well in this video. I've made a point about lockups here with regards to backlogs and all the rest of it. Um, and it could be argued that lockups are both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, but with the lockup, I seem to have it's kind of given me a little bit more structure in one sense and then obviously it's given me a little bit of a, a negative point on on another hand as well so of course i've had all these big holes and also even big holes from the auction house and with these backlogs with whether you want to call them pile of sh piles of shame or whatever with all these kind of all this unlisted stock there also comes quite a lot of wastage if you're going to charity shops, if you're going to car boots, um, and even maybe in some cases if you're going to auctions and you're kind of being a bit more selective at auctions, um, generally you can kind of pick up what you want and that's that. Especially at car boots and charity shops, you're not going to be taking home loads of things that you don't want. But 
In particular from these auction boxes, auction job lots, you'll find, and if you've been doing auction for a long time, I'm preaching to the choir here, um, but if you've been doing auction for a long time, you'll know this, that you get this wastage. And therefore, you may have quite a large pile, you may have quite a, a large amount of stock, but then you're spending a lot of time going through it, and half of it's not worth listing, and then obviously you're spending more time doing that, and uh, and then you're filtering out the bits that can be listed and putting them on your photography area to photograph. Um, but it can kind of be deceptive because you've got all this stock, but actually you haven't got as much as you first thought. And actually a lot of it is just sat there. It's just either dead stock or not worth listing or when you list it, it's going to be sticky stock. So you've also got to determine uh, again when, or as well whether your backlog is actually a backlog of, of gold or whether it's a backlog um, of, of ba or basically just a pile of shame, you know, just a backlog that isn't even worth much, essentially, or there's, there's not much to list in there. So I've also wrote down here, actually going nicely on to the next point here, is it a pile of shame or an, un un or an unlisted pile of gold? Now, I'm not talking about your psychological viewpoint on it as calling it a pile of gold opposed to a pile of shame. I'm actually trying to ground some reality in people here and actually think, well, is it actually a pile of shame or is it an unlisted pile of gold? You see, if it's an unlisted pile of gold in your backlog, then for me, it's perfectly fine to have a backlog. Go for it. It's a nice little uh, nice little um, kind of uh, a squirrel hoarding the nuts away for maybe winter or whatever it may be, or obviously quarter four or something like that. Um, but it's nice, you've got like a nice little pile of stuff that you can fall back on, um, and also that you can process at, at whatever rate you want to process it at. Um, so therefore, if it's an unlisted pile of gold, it, it's perfectly fine, it's brilliant, and, and I would encourage a backlog of that, essentially. Now, as I say, we'll get into the growth of backlogs and where backlogs can become somewhat of a burden in a little bit but certainly if you just got a fairly small backlog um maybe you've got half a room full of stuff or quarter of a room full of stuff as a backlog and um you know essentially it, it is an unlisted pile of gold there's not really much crap in there then that's brilliant now if you've got just maybe a quarter of a room full half a room full maybe you've even got a room full of not necessarily directly a pile of shame because there's always going to be stuff in there that's worth listing and that's that's decent and might even be items in there that are, that are really high value but if you've got a you know that sort of space full with mainly stuff that is from let's say auction job lots and maybe they're not the best quality auction job lots and you've got to sort through them and there's part of them you're chucking away and all the rest of it that's when it can start to think you can start to think to yourself hmm well, is it worth me having this pile of shame, really, if half of this or 30% of this is uh, I'm ending up charitying or I'm ending up putting on the car boot pile or I'm ending up throwing back in the auction house or whatever, then it's not really so much of a good pile of shame or a good, or let's say a good backlog. Um, so you've got to also think about that question, you know, is it a pile of shame or is it a, an unlisted pile of gold? And, and really... Uh, this is something for me that um, I've had to be honest with myself on several occasions of, right, look, what is this stuff? Is it good? Is it bad? And if I'm just keeping this for the sake of keeping it, why, you know, why am I doing that? Why don't I get it down to a car boot and get it sold and get some money back out of it, just a little bit of money back out of it? Why don't I get it down to the auctions and put, you know, put a few boxes in the auction and, and really be a bit more honest with yourself in that way? And maybe even take some stuff to the tip or the charity if it's really just not good stuff, essentially. It's really dirty or it's, so it's even broken or something. You might just want to take it to the tip. So, yeah, that's something to think about. And then I wanted to also touch upon motivation uh, to sort through your backlog. So, essentially, it's quite hard to get motivation to sort through your backlog. I still struggle with this. Oh, my God. I'm actually, today or the start of today... I was working through a bit of my backlog and uh, I pulled out about 20 items or so for the next day or so. And um, I really wasn't in the mood. I mean, there's so much stuff in, in the spare room under those processing tables that 
if I'm very, very honest, has just stayed there for quite a long time. There's some bits that I've pulled out and then new bits have gone in. But there's also stuff in there that has been there for a long time. So then you look at it and you're looking at it and you're looking at it. It's getting very, very samey. And, uh, and then you just don't want to deal with it. And maybe you pull it out a few times and then you don't end up dealing with it. And then you end up putting it back. I mean, that's what I've done. Um, and then... You maybe pull it out and think, right, I'm definitely going to do it this time. And then you end up finally doing it. But then more stuff ends up replacing that space. Um, and then that just stays there for months on end again. I'm terrible for this. Um, and I just end up sorting the good stuff out of the job lots. And then obviously I'm buying an, another auction hall or another auction job lot. And then, then I just take the good stuff out of that. And then you end up get getting left with all this, uh, well, all this stuff that, that's harder to process essentially. And again, we're actually going to come on to um, talking about actually sorting the good and bad stuff and maybe how to do that as well in a little bit. So, yeah. Um, oh, no, actually, no, I've, I've actually got it in this point here. Um, it's right that it's on the next point here. Um, so, yeah, basically, when you, what you've got to do, really, to get this motivation to sort your backlog is... You know, if you're low on cash or you're low on cash flow or something, that's going to be a very, very strong motivator because or it will be for most people. Because if you've not got cash, then you've got to just sort through your backlog. You've got to just try and pull stuff out. You know, at the moment, I'm going through quite a slow sales period. So it's motivating me a little bit more to actually get in that backlog, get pull some of the stuff out that I've been resisting dealing with for quite a while because there are a few items in there that are actually pretty decent um and it's just that i've not sorted them because there may be uh for well various different reasons maybe it's some things that are not really in my niche and i pick them up they are pretty good items but they're just harder for me to deal with because they're not in my niche maybe it's things that either need something doing with them, need testing, cleaning, whatever it may be. And yeah, they may be good items, but I've just not got the motivation to do it or the rest of it. So yeah, if you're low on cash, that's a good one because that will motivate you to get going and, and just and just get stuck in. And my next point, of course, is just get stuck in, just do it. Um, because that's something that you just have to do. You know, sometimes you know, there might not be any motivation there, but you've got to summon your own motivation. You've got to, that's how you've got to be in business, essentially. You've got to summon your own motivation um, when you can, sort of at will, I suppose, uh, on certain occasions anyway. So you just get stuck in. I know it's going to be hard. I know it's going to be frustrating to, to sort backlogs, to sort piles of shame, to sort items that you don't want to deal with. But the end of the day once you've done it my god when you really do it i mean i didn't have a, a really good go at it today but when i've had really good goes at my backlog in the past i felt so good because all this stuff um that partly i thought i might not make much money on or it might end up going to the car boot or whatever um i've ended up pull pulling things out and realizing oh i've actually got a bit of money here and i'm gonna list all these items on ebay and i've 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 pulled out you know, 30 items or 40 items or something to list in which I really didn't think I would have that much. Or maybe I've even pulled out, I think there was one time I went through my backlog, I pulled out about 60 items um, of, of items to list because obviously what happens, as I mentioned earlier on, is sometimes things can feed into your backlog that um, essentially you, you just need to whack them in the charity or you just need to whack them in the car boot pile or whatever it may be. So sometimes when you sort your backlog, you might not think that you have as much to actually resell on eBay, to actually list on eBay as you were thinking, but it turns out sometimes you do. And then that gives you a boost because you've sorted through all this stuff, you've cleaned things up, you've sort, you know, you've really done a good job with it. And then you can get it photographed and that's that done then. Uh, obviously, once it's photographed, you can just get on and list it. But generally, I always feel once you've got your, especially when you're attacking your piles of shame, once you've got your photographs done, that seems to be a good cutoff point for me in terms of feeling that I've achieved what I set out to achieve. Because I know that if I've got my photos done, I'm going to list them at some point. They're going to get listed. So I don't worry about that too much. But if I don't do my photos, if I if I don't get to that stage, I always feel a little bit deflated because I think, oh, well, I've not really fully processed the backlog. But as I say, once I've cleaned them, tested them, and then finally photographed them, then I do feel like I've got somewhere. 
So, next point that I was uh, alluding to a minute ago is do the harder items first, then finish on the easier items. Now, I used to practice what I preach in this. I used to do this all the time, um, and it worked for me very, very well for quite a long period of time. And when I was sorting my backlog, I'd photograph the harder items first, and yeah, okay, it would be a real chore, and I'd and, and sometimes I'd be moaning about it, oh, I've got to do this, and you know, all the rest of it. But I'd do it, and um, and then obviously I'm onto the easier items, and because you're onto the easier items, you're thinking to yourself, oh, this is brilliant, now I've got a nice easy ride of it, and you're really loving that kind of latter part of it, because you've obviously, you've just got these easier items to do. Now, obviously, what we, we all... What constitutes easy items to photograph for different people will be different, of course. So, for me, easy items to photograph are anything small. Just little smalls that, um, whether they're ceramics, whether they're Lego minifigures, whether they're little, I don't know, e even things like, uh, I've, I've um, photographed a few ashtrays and stuff like that in the past, and things like that, and just little, little tiny pieces of silver plate or... All those kind of things, I don't even know really, just really small items that are nice, easy to photograph. Anything sealed, again, anything new and sealed, that's easy for me to photograph. But then for other people, for me, what's probably the hardest to photograph and the hardest to summit motivation to do is if I've got any shirts or if I've got any... Um, not necessarily trousers, because you know, every, every now and then I pick up some Levi's or something like that and... Um, then obviously I, I can photograph them fairly easily, um, but anything clothing that needs attaching to my mannequin, I do have a mannequin actually, um, but anything that needs attaching to that and all the rest of it, I have to get that out and it's just not easy for me, but for someone else, clothing will be the easiest thing for them to photograph and then other things that I enjoy photographing more won't be easy for them, so yeah. Do the harder items first, get them out of the way, and then finish on the easier items, and that'll help clear your backlog and uh, really get you some some good value out of it as well. Get some good value of listed stuff out of it and stuff that you may uh, that may have just been left there for for you know many more months if you hadn't have come to do it. So, um, where what are we now? So where to clear sticky stock? So, obviously, we're moving on a little bit to sticky stock in this point uh, from, of course, backlogs. So, of course, we have sticky stock. It's something that most of us have. I'm sure that everyone has it to a certain degree. I'm sure that um, some people, maybe you have a higher sell-through rate, maybe selling certain niches, will have a lot lower volume of sticky stock than other people who sell in other niches. So, for example, I have quite a lot of sticky stock. Uh, some of it, it's very hard to define, actually, whether certain bits are sticky or whether they're just slow sellers because being within collectibles, selling a lot of collectibles and possibly even a few antiques as well, I gen generally the sell-through rate is lower and some with a lot of items you can be looking for the right person, all that sort of stuff. Um, and so the more bread and butter ceramics and the more kind of, um, not just bread and butter, but the more low value ceramics, because there's bread and butter and then there's low value. Bread and butter gives the indication that things are selling fairly quickly and that that's kind of your, your bread and butter turnover, essentially. But there's also low value things that aren't necessarily bread and butter. They are kind of bread and butter in value, but they do still take quite a while to sell. So they're not necessarily bread and butter um ground sales like that you know that keep the business running they're just low value things that take a while to sell so um there's, there's things like that with, with what i sell and it's hard to think to myself well should i take them off at x point or should i keep them on because you never know there's those people out there that obviously come along and pick them up pick them off and some people some things you are just waiting for the right buyer so it can be sometimes a little bit harder to distinguish in certain niches whether it's sticky or whether it's just items that are just generally taking longer to sell because of maybe their uniqueness or maybe you know just not as many people are looking for them but of course when we can identify that we have got some sticky stock when we know that there's certain things that are definitely sticky and as I say, this might be easier to, to identify with someone who's selling electronics or toys or something like that. 
Um, and of course, the definition of sticky stock will change as well between categories. So for me, really, anything sticky take, is something that takes over a year to sell, really. I don't mind waiting three to six months for something to sell. I'm not bothered. Now, someone listening to this could be saying, my God, that's ridiculous. You're going to wait six months or 12 months for, for something to sell. And they're completely right in saying that as well, like, because maybe they sell in a niche that is very, very fast turnover. And, you know, they wouldn't want to wait more than three weeks or more than four weeks for something to sell. So, again, they're correct in, in that sort of niche. But, of course, with my niche that I'm in, it is a bit more of a slower selling niche. So, therefore, I kind of have to attitude, I have to adopt a little bit of a laissez-faire um, demeanor towards things when they're selling and, and for how long I'm listing them and all the rest of it. Um, so, obviously... Once we've identified that sticky stock and once you've kind of got some ground rules for what you constitute sticky stock, I suppose, and where you cut it off, maybe for you sticky stock is three months, uh, you know, anything that doesn't sell after three months, maybe it's after six months, maybe it's after 12 months, maybe it's after two weeks. I don't know. It could be different for everyone. I don't think it's going to be after two weeks for a lot of people, but you know, it may be, there may be some people who like things turned over in a day, I'm not sure, um, so, yeah, once you've constituted that, then you can start to think, right, I've got this sticky stock, I know that this is sticky, um, compared to, to normal items for me that are selling a lot quicker, so where can I clear this sticky stock, so what you, what you can think to yourself is, right, well, I'm going to pull it off eBay, you know what, I, what, what I'm going to do, since I've had it on eBay, buy it now, I'm going to reduce the price quite severely and put it on auction and just see if it goes up and just get my money out of it, maybe get a little bit of profit out of it. And that'll work for me. I'm happy with that because at this point, I'm just happy to get my investment back, possibly a couple of pound profit on it. So you can always do cheap eBay auctions. You can just run a, run some auctions on eBay, take your sticky stock off, off the buy it now and relist it as auction at a lower price. You can also go down to the auction houses and you can pile up a load of stuff in a box, uh, maybe even a, quite a few boxes actually, cart them down to the auction and then you might get five, ten quid back or something uh, for a box and it's something, of course obviously you've got auction fees to contend with there so you wouldn't get the full amount back so if it sold for £10 you wouldn't get the £10 because of the auction fees and stuff. But at least you'd get something back for it. So, you, you know, you might want to build up quite a few boxes and end up taking them down to the auction. And you never know as well. There could be a little bidding war at the auction and two people getting a little bidding war. And you might get 20 quid for a box back. You never know. It might happen. And then you've got a little bit more money back from it. Chances are when you're doing that, you're just doing it to get your money back. You're not really doing it to make profit. Um, but at that point with the sticky stock, you just want to get your investment back. So then you can invest into quicker selling items. Get that turnover going again invest that money, that profit from those items that sell, those new items that sell, into even more items that sell quite quickly, and then you can just snowball it like that, essentially. So that's also one. You can also do car boots. I did a car boot not long ago. I did terribly for selling, um, but it is an option. You know, all you need to do is go to a fairly well-established car boot, one with quite well, quite a lot of uh, people that go there, whether it be buyers, well, ba basically both buyers and sellers, make sure it's a popular car boot, and uh, no doubt you're going to get some money back, and to be honest, even from some of the job lots I pick up, actually, I could basically go to car boots and just sell, and uh, just even at the car boot prices, and still make good money, because obviously some sometimes, you know, at the auction, for let's say £10, something like that, I'm getting three or four boxes worth of stuff, and generally, you know, I could probably get a couple of quid back per item, something like that, and then there'll be certain items in there that I might be able to get five, eight, ten pound at a car boot for. So I could even even just do that. I've never, I, well, I've thought of it obviously because I'm talking about it now, but I've never really actually given it incredible thought because it is quite a lot of work. It's quite a grind going down to the car boots and selling like that, especially when I maybe can get more money on eBay for for certain items in the job lots. Anyway, the other idea, of course, 
is that you take certain items out of the job lots and then sell the other lot of the car boot and then do have both kind of sale platforms running so you have ebay and your and your car boot as well um but yeah a lot so for example let's say i get a 10 pound job lot from yorkshire and you know it's three boxes worth of stuff and there might be in those three boxes 50 items or 40 items or something if you're getting a couple of quid back per item on average or maybe maybe even slightly more because there might be a, a few more items that I get close to a five or four or something for, then you know I might get 80 to 100 quid back for that little job lot and say you, you get a few of them job lots, you know, you can see how the money would add up at car boots um, and then obviously you've got your little eBay on the side picking a few different items out of them. So that would be a, a good way as well, not just to clear sticky stock, but even to generate a little bit more revenue. But again, it's one of those things that does take a bit more work. And going to the car boots each week, as I say, it's a grind. Whether you're going there to buy or whether you're going back there to sell. Of course, if you're going there to sell, it's even more of a grind because uh, you've got to set up, you've got to get up really, really early and uh you know you've got to be on it essentially so it's a hard slog so yeah that's another way you can get rid of sticky stock anyway and then charity shops of course as a last resort if obviously this isn't going to get you any money back for your stock um as you would imagine but you know at least it's going to a good place and the charity can get a bit of money back for it as well um i mean indirectly we all uh, well both directly and indirectly actually as resellers we contribute massively to charities in the UK, whether it be from in, slightly more indirectly, let's say, uh, by giving them stuff and then them obviously then directly selling it on and making money for themselves essentially, or whether it's us buying the stock from them and uh, and selling it on. And I'm sure there's certain people out there who maybe donate to charity on a regular basis, donate a little bit more money back to the charities because let's say they've made fantastic profit on things and they just want to do that as um, a gesture of goodwill essentially so we do massively contribute to the charity shops uh, the running of the charity shops the um you know the the kind of revenue that we gain the stuff that we gain all that sort of stuff so that's a nice way of looking at it as well and yeah as, as i say you won't get any money back but it, it's just a nice thing to do so I went, I've just wrote down here, we've kind of touched upon this a little bit, so I won't go into this too much. I should have actually put this point a little bit further up. So is it a good or bad thing to have a backlog? As I say, we've kind of touched on that. So for me, as I mentioned, it's a good thing um, if there's good stuff in the backlog. And then it's a bad thing if the backlog is full of... Well, not full of, but mainly, let's say, items that you need to end up clearing at car boots or clearing down the charity shops or whatever it may be. But so long as you've got good, solid items in your backlog that you feel that you can deal with at some point, then, yeah, it, it is a good thing to have a backlog. But, again, you can also get a little bit overwhelmed by your backlog. You, you can also get a little bit too much um, from your backlog uh, in terms of how big your backlog grows at some point. So... Yeah, there's two sides to it, really. There's, there's the good side and the bad side. Uh, and also storage as well. If you've got a backlog, you need to think about storage. So we'll move on anyway, because as I say, I, I did touch on that. Um, so frustrations with backlogs at uh, a lockup. So I wanted to touch upon this first off, because this is a, um, a thing that I suppose a few people overlook when they first get a lockup. Um, I think it ran through my mind a little bit when I was getting the lock up, but not as much as it has done over the past few months of actually really, you know, starting to fill up my lock up and, and using it a lot more. So the thing that people don't realize is when you get a lock up, you're kind of tied in. And what I mean by that, right, I'll give you the exam my real life example. So I've, of course, got the spare room um, for unlisted stock and I've got that and it's brilliant. But that, at the moment, is there's boxes in there, there's clutter in there, there's loads of stuff under the processing tables, all that sort of stuff. So, of course, I've got the lock up and I've got a lot of stuff down there. In fact, I've got too much stuff down there for uh, to be able to put all that stuff in my spare room. So this is what I'm saying when you're kind of tied in. I can't get rid of that. For example, if I wanted to get rid of that lock up, you know, at some point, or even if I needed to get rid of it now, if I needed to get rid of it now or, or in a few weeks time or whatever, 
I couldn't cart back all that stuff from the lockup to this house. The only way I could do that is absolutely filling half of the garage up and uh, my dad going absolutely mental that half the garage is full up and obviously he's got a load of gardening stuff in there and tools in there and all the rest of it so uh, it wouldn't be very good. So that's the only way I could do that or the other way of course the other more obvious way of doing it is that you slowly sell through the stuff at your lock up, empty it out and then obviously uh, and then obviously kind of move forward and uh, essentially uh, I don't know I suppose essentially get rid of your lock up and then you don't have much stuff coming back to your own house so that's kind of a more obvious way but the problem with that that you'll probably notice is that's going to take that might take a few months because you've not only got to get that stuff back here in little chunks because you can't take it all back at one go but you've got to slowly sell through that as well to make room for where the listed storage is um, you know to make room for more listed stock in that area so you can funnel it through essentially think of it as a what do we call them like a little conical tube or something Oh, what do, we, what do we call them? A funnel, that's it. I don't know why I forgot that. But a funnel, uh, essentially think of it as a funnel. Now, the bottom end is very, very tight, right? And then the top end is nice and open-ended. So that's kind of how it is with me now. I've got a huge amount of list, unlisted stock. but Well, not a huge amount, but, you know, a fair bit. Um, probably, I don't know, probably, I'd say maybe not more than most people or anything, but... Most full-time resellers, I've probably got a similar amount as them, right? Um, so I've got all this stuff, all this unlisted stuff going through this funnel. But if you put too much stuff through the funnel, of course, if it's water, you know, it, it's not going to really back it up too much because water flows quite nicely. But if you put a load of gunk and stuff and slime and stuff in this funnel and keep pushing it in, it's not going to come out really, really fast, is it? It's going to come out in little chunks and bits and bobs and it's not going to be brilliant. So you see where, where I'm talking about with this being tied in. I've got to get all that stuff, I've got to get all that gunk through the system, all that stock through the system very, very slowly in order to then release myself from the the um, commitment of the lockup, essentially. Now, I'm not... Uh, you know, I'm not going to get rid of the lockup anytime soon, so it's not an issue for me. If it, if I was going to get rid of the lockup, it would become an issue. But I just wanted to mention that uh, with that is one of the frustrations of a backlog and having it at a, a facility that you're paying for and that maybe you don't have a an area in your own home that could facilitate that stuff if you needed to facilitate it. So that's something you've got to be careful of. And what then happens is you start paying this monthly amount. Uh, for your lockup, and then you're thinking, oh, I really better utilize my lockup a lot more. So then you you buy more stock for your lockup, which is brilliant. You know, you're getting plenty of stock, all the rest of it. You've got plenty of stock, but then you're filling it up, and and, and then you know you've got you you're exacerbating not necessarily your problems, but you're ex exacerbating this amount of stock that you've got. But you're simply just not getting through or can't get through very quickly anyway. So that's also also got to come into it and. You've got to think, right, where do I draw the line with backlogs? Because you, it might be okay for you. It might be a want. It might be a desire for you to have five lockups and to have them all full of stuff and think to yourself, oh, brilliant, I've not got a source for ages. But you've got to think about more than that, not just about the idea of, yeah, well, it's brilliant. It would be brilliant to have that because, you know, I've got loads of stock forever. For one, what's the quality of that stock? Is it good quality stuff or have you just got random crap just to fill up five lockups worth of stuff? For two, what's the cost on those five lockups? For me, if I had five lockups, that would be, I pay £72 a month for this one now, which is a, I think it's an 80 square foot or a 60 square foot. 60 square foot or something. Um, but, you know, for me, so five times 72, what's that? Something like... 400 quid is it i don't know i'm not i'm just guessing it's it's around that isn't it it's about 370 380 quid so that's a lot of money going out 380 quid a month that is a lot that is not a small chunk of change so uh whether you're making you know a really good amount on ebay or whether you're making you know not a really good amount it's still a fair chunk of change even if let's say you're making five grand a month you know in in turnover or five six seven grand a month in turnover it's still a fair bit you know 380 quid that's still a fair bit so 
you've got to think about that and you've got to think, right, do I want quantity? Do I want quality? What's the kind of thing here? Because there's a lot of people who do resign very, very well on the quality side of things. So they may have a lockup or they may have a small area, maybe it's in their own home uh, where they can store a fair bit of stuff, but they don't let it go over that and they just focus on the quality and turning it over and keeping it going, to keeping it turned over, and therefore we don't get into this kind of grand, I suppose it's a grand system or grand kind of scale of of uh, getting more and more and more and more and more and that can sometimes be where it leads you you just want to get more and more and more and more and uh, it's definitely the the theme of my business because when I started in, and, and it's brilliant that I've documented all this from not necessarily from day one I started YouTube about five or six months into my resign I think but um you know, I still documented from when I was in this room, which is my room now where I'm recording this. I don't have any stock in this room anymore. But, um, you know, I started in this room, just very small scale, then moved to the spare room, then branched off, branched off, branched off, etc. And now I've got about three rooms full of stuff, um, both unlisted and listed. So uh, you can see how it can scale up quite, quite easily. And uh, if you're not attentive to that quality and actually making the sales, you can stu soon start to just get an, an unholy amount of unlisted stock and uh, and maybe even listed stock as well. But you're kind of getting into this, I want more and more and more and more and more, and you're not focusing too much on that, the latter part of that funnel of actually making sales and getting getting this cash flow coming through and you're more focused on getting the stock getting the stock getting the stock and that's when you can start to get yourself into cash flow crises and things like that and uh, and get yourself into a bit of a sticky situation essentially uh pardon the pun with sticky stock of course but i don't know it wasn't really much of a pun um but anyway so uh where are we now so I posed a few questions on, um, I did a post on my community tab as I normally do, and I did a post on Instagram and I posed a few questions and I thought I would just talk through these questions. I've also got a response on my Insta, so of course I will uh, look at that comment at the end of the podcast as I normally do. Wow, we're on 30 minutes or about 37 minutes. I've rambled so much and I've, I'm only halfway down my list, so I'll get a crack on. Um, so... Right. Should you keep stock listed that has been on for one or two years? So again, we touched on this a little bit before about different people have different time periods for what constitutes sticky stock. Um, but should you keep items on for one or two years? I've got quite a lot of items on from, I don't know, 12 months, 18 months ago, something like that. I think in my personal opinion, and my personal opinion on this has changed numerous times over the course of my resign. So my opinions are subject to change from new experiences I have and from, you know, gaining more experience with the job. So don't just take these opinions as completely, these are going to be my opinions forever, because generally what I've found with Resign and the more I've done it is all my diff all the opinions I've had have been blown out of water and then I've formulated new opinions when I've got new experiences. So this is just my opinion as of this point in time. Um, so essentially the stuff that i've got on that you know is 18 months old or 12 months old something like that generally it's not gonna sell very well so there might be some items that will sell fairly well at, at that point or there might be well not fairly well but they uh because sell some when you sell something fairly well that actually indicates that it's going to sell quickly these items have been on for 12 or 18 months but there will be some items at that range that do get picked off even after 12 months maybe it's a rarity maybe it's something that you know maybe not not a lot of people are looking for and then the right buyer comes along whatever it may be especially in antiques and collectibles in this particular niche i'm in in other niches then 12 to 18 months having something on like a toy or a game or something like that just get it gone. Just try and get it gone because, yeah, at that point, it's obviously something's drastically wrong. And, of course, I've still got a few toys and games on. Um, 
I'm going to be honest and say that. You know, I've still got a few toys and games on that have been on for 12 or 18 months. And clearly something is, is wrong with those items. Maybe it's a title. Maybe it's a photo. Maybe it's that they're out of demand these days. The market's become saturated. Whatever it may be. But something in those more quicker selling niches, something's clearly going wrong and you need to address that. So... It, again, it's, a, it's somewhat of a, it depends what niche you're in, but I would even say if you're in antiques and collectibles, I would, even if at that one to two year mark, I would seriously still consider, and this is what I do, seriously still consider revising items, uh, you know, adding things to them in the titles or whatever, um, maybe taking things off, uh, putting them on auction if possible, if they're an in-demand item for auction. Um, because sometimes it might be just that you're buying now, price is a little bit high and you've not you've not brought it down or maybe you know you just need to whack them on auction and get them gone at a lower price. Sometimes it can just be that and they've just been sticky in that regard. Um, but yeah, if even, let's say, in that one to two year bracket of antiques and collectibles, try different things. Get, take some items off as well, get them down the car boots, get some money back for them, even if it's just your cost price, and uh, and just sort them out in that way. I would say for most people watching this who are selling in electricals, toys and games, uh, you know, all these different niches like that, I would say if you're at the one to two year mark, that's probably a long enough time period for things to sell, so something is going quite wrong. With antiques and collectibles, it might there's maybe a little bit more leeway there because certain things do just generally take a while to go. Um, so, yeah, that's that one there anyway. So, I don't really think you should keep stock. Um, definitely for no more than the two years, I would say. But, you know, if you're in certain niches, one year isn't so bad. But then if you're in other niches, one year might be quite a while. So, again, it's a bit more subjective, as I mentioned. So next, um, is there a right amount of listings to have? If not, why? So I personally don't believe there is a right amount of listings to have. Um, I know there's all these numbers thrown around like, oh, you need to have 500 items listed for full time. And yeah, I believed that for quite a while. I thought, oh yeah, that's probably quite a good number. And I've heard numerous amounts of people say this. Um, and yeah, it's a pretty good number, actually. If you're going to peg a number on how many listings you need to be to be full-time, 500 is probably a decent number. However, I have more recently, probably over the past few months, uh, seen, been into contact with people who have, who are full-time resellers, who have 200, 300, 350 items. I think it's Craigslist Hunter as well. He only has, or I don't know what he has now, but... Um, is he normally or used to hover around 350 you've got chad uh what, what's his name on you golden finger picker um uh, you know he used to when i was watching him he used to only have 250 300 listings so yeah you don't necessarily need to have 500 listed you don't necessarily need to have 5,000 listed you know I would say generally, if you're going to be full time, you, you've got to have 200 listed, really. Unless you're selling something major, you know, unless you're selling really high value items uh, that have a fairly decent sell through um, and that for whatever reason you're picking them up fairly cheaply, you're making a very, very good margin on them and you only need 100 items or 200 items listed, then, then you, know, you might be able to do it. But I'd say at least 200 you know, if not more about three or four hundred range. But really there is no number. There's there's so many variables. This is what I found in my experience. There's far too many variables. I have uh what, forty well I'm about fourteen fifty listings on at the moment. And you can scrap some of them them listings because as I've said, some of them are sticky. As I mentioned this in the previous podcast, some of them are sticky some of them need revising, some of them don't have very good photos on because they're a year or 18 months or so old when I had different photo areas or wasn't maybe paying as much attention to my photography. So, it, you know, it's not that having 
Five thousand items is brilliant. Someone who has five thousand items is brilliant. Someone has two hundred items is, is crap. It couldn't be further from the truth. You could actually reverse those people around. Someone who has two hundred items could be making far more than someone who has five thousand items. Honestly, and you could you can see. I could probably give if I thought about it a little bit. I could probably give real life examples of this of different resellers who are obviously earning more than than other ones that are doing way more listings i'm not going to do that because that's a bit more p personal information but i know people who are on like you know two three hundred listings two or three hundred listings opposed to people who are on a thousand or two thousand or three thousand and the people who are on 200 listings are making more than the people who are on two or three thousand so get yourself out of don't get talked into basically this idea that you need a certain set amount of listings now, I did want to talk about uh, sell-through rates in different niches. Uh, Ken's touched upon this, actually. I've heard Ken touch upon this quite a lot. But essentially, let's say you have a 20% sell-through rate, right? Then you're going to... Let's say you have 500 items listed. Then you would sell 100 items a month, right? If you have a 20% sell-through rate every month, 500 items listed, you're selling 100 of those items. You're selling 20% of your inventory now if you had if let's say we take another person and they have 500 items listed but they're in a slightly different niche and they have 10 percent sell through rate a month then they're only going to sell 50 items now of course i know it's greater than this because we've got to explore, explore average selling prices of the, of the people and all the rest of it but let's just say those two people have an average selling price of you know 20 quid we both have an average selling price of 20 quid that guy is going to make the 10 percent sell through rate guy is going to make a grand in sales a month the other guy is going to make what two grand in sales per month now so so that shows that sell through rate is also really key so if you're in a good you know and this comes down to choosing your niche as well so if you choose your niche well, and let's say you're in toys and games, then you're going to have a higher sell-through. So you're going to need less listings. And let's say you have uh, a good average selling price as well. That's going to affect you positively because you've got a better average sale. So you don't need to sell as much. So long as your buy-in price is pretty good and you've, you've got a good margin on your items. So really, average sale price, um, you know, sell through rate these are the things that are going to determine it so if let's say you're in a naturally slower selling niche let's again take antiques and collectibles because that's a slower selling niche in general there's certain items in antiques and collectibles that will go very very fast there's certain sub niches in antiques and collectibles that are very very hot and that will go very very fast but generally you know overall it's quite a slower selling niche so then you're going to buy, by default, essentially, you're going to need more listings to get to a decent wage. You're going to need more listings to actually uh, produce the same level of income as someone else who is in the toys and games niche or whatever it may be. So someone who's in antiques and collectibles, they might need 1,500 items. They might need 2,000 items. Someone who's in electricals, toys and games... Uh, vintage toys or what you know whatever it may I don't know it could I'm just spouting off these things because these are quite hot selling items they're quite fast selling items maybe even clothing could be in there as well um, but they're gonna need that person who's gonna need far less they might need only a third of the inventory that the person doing antiques and collectibles will, will need so you know they might need I don't know what 400 items the antique and collectibles person might need 1,200. So that's why generally you see or you hear that people, if they say to you, oh, I sell antiques and collectibles, they generally say when you ask them how many listings they've got, they'll generally say over 1,000, you know, they'll say 2,000, 3,000, whatever, because generally it's a more slow selling niche. Now, there are people out there who do do antiques and collectibles and do have a smaller inventory. And those people are, and I've talked to, chat, chatted to those people and stuff. Now, those people are doing slightly more high end antiques and they're doing less of them. And that is a very, very good way to go. It's something that I want to slowly branch into. Um, and it's something that I continually try to do um, and try to buy a few more upmarket antiques if I can. Um, but I still am very quite attached actually to buying the job lots and stuff i still love doing that so you know when you speak to those people they might only have 500 listings or 400 listings just like the toy sellers 
But because they're doing more market antiques, they've got a far superior average selling price. And maybe they do have a slightly greater uh, sell-through rate because, let's say, they're slightly more desirable antiques. Um, but it's probably not going to be too much greater. It might be something like 15% or something. Something like that, I'm not sure. I'm just spouting a, a, a figure there, a percentage. But it's not going to be too dissimilar from that percentage. Um but that's going to mean that obviously they don't need as many listings. So there's there's so many different variables, so many different ways to do it. And of course, so many different things are going to impact it. Um, you know, I mean, even just fundamental things like the economy or the weather or things like this, they're going to impact your selling, uh, average sell-through rate uh, from a month-to-month -month basis. Um, you know, the ability to pick up certain items at certain points of the year, that's going to affect it because at certain points of the year, you might not be able to find as many of those really fast selling items. You might be able to only find slower selling items. So it's all going to affect it. Quarter four, especially if you're selling toys and games, that's going to really affect your selling price, average sell, uh, your sell through rate and maybe even your average selling price. Your average selling price might go up in quarter four. Your average sell through rate will probably go up. So that's going to fluctuate. So it's all in a constant flux, really, this. And there's so many different variables, so many different ways to do it, so many different niches to explore, so many different products to buy and sell, that it's going to be completely different for everyone. It's going to, There might be two people who are very similar, but it's, they're always going to be slightly just just slightly different in maybe their sell through rate or something within their store something within what they sell even if they almost look identical let's say in what they're selling and what they're doing so it's very very hard to establish uh, the right amount of listing that, that uh, listings that's what i'm trying to get through and don't kid yourself into thinking that oh if i get to 500 items let's say you're a new reseller and you got 20 items on eBay. And I, I remember when I heard about that and it was like, oh my God, this is a mammoth task to get to what I want to get to. And it was, it was a lot of hard work actually. But, um, you know, I kind of kidded myself into thinking, oh, well, at 500 listings, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be cool. And yeah, I mean, I was making a good income at 500 listings and stuff. It was decent. But, you know, now I'm at 1,450, you know, so it's... There's not this right amount, it's just you, it's what you need to do essentially. If you're not selling that much, then you need to list more. And therefore, by, by natural, just by a natural progression, your, your, your inventory or your number of listings you've got is going to increase. And then what you're going to come, come across is a point in which you can't go any further because you're selling as much as you can list. And then that's your kind of level. But that level, as I mentioned, because of all these different variables, is going to be different for everyone. You know, it's going to be all over the place. And uh, some people might not reach that level till 5,000 items. Other people might not reach that level till 300 items. It really, really depends. So just get out of that mentality of thinking, I need X number of listings. Of course, that doesn't mean to say, um, don't have the motivation to try and do new listings and to put new items on, but just don't think too heavily around the idea that 500 listings and you've made it, or 1,000 listings and you've made it, because that's it just doesn't work like that. It's too There's too much variance in, in what we do. So I also actually wanted to mention as a final point, and then I'll move on to the Insta comment I've got, um, optimum inventory can also be subjective. So again, that's kind of what we've just touched upon. So, um, but I've also put here, so long as your inventory is pulling in the money that you need each month, that is fine. So don't think about, oh, you know, what this person's doing or what the other person's doing or they've got X number of listings and they're making X amount of money and you need to get to that because that's where you're going to make X amount of money. Just think on your situation. Are you making enough money right now? Are you making the money you need? And if you are not, then you need to plow on, you need to keep listing, and then you'll soon start to hit that optimum inventory level. And then what you can do, uh, obviously once you've hit that, you can just basically replenish. But then you can think to yourself, right, am I making enough at this optimum inventory level? Or maybe what I need to do is increase my average selling price because clearly what I, you know, I'm not making enough at this um 
at this kind of inventory level. Um, but I can't list anymore. I'm listing the sales as fast as I'm selling. But I need to make more money. So then you have to up your average selling price. So you need to put, you need to find items for the same price as you you're currently finding them for but obviously getting a greater sales figure for them and then that will mean that you end up making more money in the process so yeah just make sure the the, the one key thing really in my opinion is making sure that you can earn enough for yourself uh, if you're not earning enough for yourself then you need to get cracking when the going gets tough the tough get going all that sort of stuff get cracking get plowed down Get thinking, get strategizing about what you can do to pull your business into that position of uh, where you need it or where you want it to be. So, yeah, definitely have have a look at that. So, one second, I'm just literally, I've just literally logged on to my phone. I'm just pulling up that comment from Instagram. So, we have uh, the Wicked Kitty again. So, thank you very much for your comment. Um, personally, I only take sticky stock off when I need the space on eBay. I have a basic shop, 253 listings, so I try to keep it there. I like to have a small backlog to have something to list even when I couldn't find much. Yeah, that's definitely good. And that is a, a very, it kind of sums up actually similar to what I've been talking about at certain points in this podcast about, you know, this kind of backlog is good when it's kind of managed, when it's manageable, when um, uh, when essentially it's not necessarily full of crap and when there's actually decent items in there um, and then it can get a little bit frustrating or it can get a little bit um, out of hand when it becomes this big thing, when it becomes too huge and when you're getting all these different job lots and in the job lots are all these kind of items as I touched upon that maybe aren't worth reselling as, as much as other items. So that can be when it when it kind of gets a little bit out of hand. So yeah, that's quite a nice comment there. It, quite, it sums it up quite nicely, actually. Um, and actually, it's an interesting point about obviously taking stuff off eBay when you only need the space. That's quite interesting. Um, I kind of... I think I've done that a couple of times. When I've needed the space, I've pulled a few bits and bobs off. Um, certainly, obviously, bigger items mainly. Um, but normally when I have when I run out of a bit of space, I um, sometimes put a few bits on auction or what I will do is simply just have a reorganize of my uh, listed stock area. So I'll just literally uh, organize the shelves, condense things down as best I can. And then I might get another couple of shelves for you out of it. And then I can I can list more stuff you see there and grow my inventory a bit more. Um so yeah, I mean that's kind of what I do, and 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 that seems to work. But also pulling it off eBay is a is a good way of doing it as well. So I don't know what you do with those items from then and there. Maybe you car boot them. Maybe you uh, put them in the auctions or something. I'm not sure. Maybe you uh, do do some eBay auctions with them. But yeah, so that is everything. So thank you there to uh, for that comment as well. As I mentioned, next week's episode will be the rise of YouTube in reselling. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? What do you think about it? It's a polarizing topic, as I mentioned. So put your comments down below. If uh, you would like to get in touch about next week's topic, please do visit my Instagram. There will be my handle on screen now. Um, and yeah, just go over there, message me with whatever you would like to talk about, uh, whatever your comment is centered around that topic. And if you would like to comment, um, but it's of course next week when you're watching this podcast or whenever it may be, then you might not have missed the cutoff. The cutoff basically is around Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, because Wednesday morning, every Wednesday morning, I record these podcasts and I do a community tab post on my YouTube that you, you may have seen actually every week on about, normally about a Monday, at some point on a Monday, and then you have a day or two to obviously get those comments in um, and over to me. So if you're watching this on Monday, I will put that community tab post up up on Monday and then you'll have a day or so to get your comments in as well that way. So yeah, you will have a couple of days, get these comments in and then I will be on to recording that episode. So yeah, if you enjoyed it, please do give it a like. Obviously subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And we're just coming up to the hour there. So that's quite a nice one there. I have done a bit of rambling actually in this one. Didn't think it would be an hour this one. I thought this might only be a half an hour podcast, but 
Turns out I've rambled enough, so I didn't even ramble that much about my own experiences at the start of some of the hauls and stuff that I had. I was I was I was planning to elaborate a little bit more on that, but obviously I didn't. So that's okay anyway. So I will see you in the next one, guys. Thank you very much for watching.